Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jose Huizar, Chair of the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Uh, I've been joined by Marquise Harris-Dawson, uh, Mitch Englander, and Felipe Fuentes. Uh, we're going to get this meeting started and go to item 11. I understand uh, we will receive and file that. Our director is not here. So we'll rec re receive and file item number 11. Uh, we will now go to item number 3, please. Sure. Um, Councilman, item 3 is a zone change and a height district change ordinance in CD13. Welcome. Is staff here, please? How's that? Better. So, um, I left off talking about residential uses. So the Q condition would restrict residential uses only to live, work, job productive uses, which is really consistent with the vision for this fairly small, isolated area in Elysian Valley. Um, the Planning Commission uh, adopted and recommended approval of the changes unanimously, and uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you. Not now, but we'll go through some quick cards that we have. I'll call three at a time. Uh, Tracy Stone, Alan Anderson, Damian Robledo. You each have a minute to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Tracy Stone. I'm a property owner and I live and work in Elysian Valley. And I'm strongly in support of the revisions. I want to thank our planning department and our council office for leading the charge on this. Uh, I have submitted a letter to you with a couple of comments. Uh, in general, the current Q conditions would allow for development that is uh, greatly out of scale with the carrying capacity of our streets, of our sewers, of our general infrastructure, and I think that the proposed revisions would go a long way towards addressing that. Um, in specific, I think the building height change from 45 to 30 is very critical in reducing the density. I did want to draw your attention to one item that I have been um, continuing to reference, the noise one, which requires... Uh, that uh, a acoustical engineer design an enclosure for any equipment. We have a lot of makers in our area, uh, craftsmen, cabinet makers, and so on. And I think that the burden of requiring an acoustical engineer to design the enclosure is a, a very big one. And I wanted to propose some uh, revised language. Okay. That would establish a threshold. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen Anderson, Damien Robledo, Mary Villarreal. Hi, my name's Alan Anderson. I also live and work in Elysian Valley. I've uh, been there about 13 years. Um, I'm very much in favor of these new changes. Uh, imagine, if you will, along the river between uh, Figueroa and Fletcher, what if there were 45-foot tall buildings along that whole area of the bike path? We do not want that. We would like to have the kinds of things that are represented in this uh, Q condition revision. Uh, occur sooner than uh, sort of overboard development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Damien Robledo, Mary Villarreal, Patricia Perez. Hello, esteemed members of the Plum Committee. Uh, my name is Damien Robledo, artist and designer with a small business in Elysian Valley. And uh, I've supported this uh, Q condition revision for quite some time now. I want to commend the uh, council office for working with the community and with the planning department. Um, this goes to show that uh, through dialogue and continued uh, contributions that we can come up with a uh, joint uh, uh, 
a revision to zoning changes that represent the community. So I want to say that I'm in support of the current uh, Q condition revision and the 30 foot height is uh, imperative. Thank you. Thank you. Go Bears. Mary Villarreal, uh, Patricia Perez. Mary won't present, be presenting, uh, but I will, my Patricia Perez. Um, Ma'am, ma uh, so Mary Villarreal is not here? She's here, but she's not up to standing We, up we don't, um, we usually don't uh, convert time over. Uh, no, no, that's fine. She, she's going to present still? You're going to come up no, still? She's, she's, no, she doesn't want to speak. Okay, that's fine. Lady. That's fine. Okay, Patricia okay. Perez. Yes. Thank you. And Cynthia uh, Hubeck. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm a uh, lifetime resident. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm a lifetime. Okay, remember to Thank you. Okay, I'm a lifetime resident, and I am uh, for this change. Um, and please uh, keep our community uh, down in height and not overdeveloped. Uh, I'm not for this noise restriction. Possibly new building would be in that case, but I think that the people that are living working now are not interfering with anybody at the moment. So I don't think noise restriction is necessary, but I do ask you that you do not overdevelop our community and do not go up in height because the environment is not good for the environment nor the migratory birds that fly through our community. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Hubach, Arturo Gomez, and Christine Peters. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Cynthia Hubach. I own the Blake Avenue Lofts on Blake Avenue. I started the Elysian Valley Community Garden across the street. We're already feeling the impact of the development in Elysian Valley right next door to the lofts next door to the garden. We're going to have 117 um, new units, market rate units moving in. It's going to change the demographics of the neighborhood dramatically increase in population by about 4%. That's just that one small um, development. So um, because of the issues that have been brought up of infrastructure, safety, egress, um, I really strongly support these new queue conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arturo Gomez, Christine Peters. Uh, hello. Uh, I am a resident of uh, Elysian Valley. I am also a member of the Elysian Roofs. Uh, Elysian Valley Riverside Neighborhood Council. And I would just like to say that uh, I'm in full support of um, these new proposed queue conditions. I feel that by lowering the height um, of uh, proposed developments in our community, that will uh, be able to curb the, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, problem of gentrification. But I also feel that this isn't a quick fix. I think uh, from here on out, well, we should uh, continue to work to, um, you know, support our, our community and, uh, hopefully uh, not have people uh, kicked out of their homes, but uh, that's just me. Anyway, um, I'd like to thank you for uh, putting this, um, this amendment into consideration, and uh, I hope it passes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Last speaker. Good afternoon, Council Members. Christine Peters, Office of Council Member O'Farrell. Uh, Council Member O'Farrell asked for your support on these thoughtful and sensitive updates to the Silver Lake Elysian Valley Echo Park Community Plan Q condition updates. Um, Elysian Valley, or as we like to call it, Frog Town, is our very special island in CD13. It's surrounded by the 2 Freeway, the 5 Freeway, the Los Angeles River, uh, Union Pacific Rail Line, and the Metrolink Lines. Um, it's literally an island engulfed amongst uh, many of uh, urban uses. Uh, there has been a significant amount of interest in the area with the recent adoption of the Arbor Study of the LA River um, U.S. Army Corps study, and an unintended consequence of that adoption uh, was a huge amount of investment and speculation in the area by development and developers. Uh, the 118 parcels that we're asking to have rezoned were downzoned from M2 to CM in the 2004 Echo Park Community Plan update. Uh, as a result of that, one of the goals that was achieved was to allow the properties to be used for live work and for mixed use. However, the unintended consequence was is they then became eligible for high density, um, luxury, and market rate 
housing development rather than what the community had been asking for was this continuing of the maker and um, live work uses that the community is known for. So having seen that and looking at how development was happening after 10 years of the community plan adoption, we introduced a motion last year asking that the planning department work with our office to uh, reduce certain elements on these 118 parcels so that it would bring it back to the intent of what the council member had always seen for the area, which was a combination of live work uses and residential mixed with commercial so that we can continue that um, unique and artistic character for the area. Um, in the years since, the river was declared navigable and a recreation zone was established and a billion dollar investment was announced for the area. So it's, it's critical for us as an office to make sure that these um, these amendments to the queue conditions get adopted so that the community can have confidence that the city is working in their best interest. And that also, if we could ask that the planning department could actually clarify item H, which was the issue that the constituent brought up about the noise, because it's our office's intent, that this would only be intended for new construction and for new builds. So if somebody was coming in to do a new commercial manufacturing element and it was adjacent to a residential use, that they would then be required to do the acoustic um, consulting, but otherwise if it's an existing use and it's already there and it's already a welding shop or a manufacturer, it would not make sense to ask them to, you know, be forced to retroactively upgrade to something that's not adjacent to residential uses. So if, if planning could clarify that for us and make sure that item H is, is, is adopted as intended and, and not creating an onerous um, restriction for, um, for residents. Yes, thank you. Can we have planning answer that question, please? Craig Weber, planning staff. There are a number of development standards in the queue condition that are intended to address land use issues where we have industrial immediately adjacent to residential zones. Um, and I regret item H is not worded in the way that the rest of them are, so I think planning would actually welcome a, a motion to amend item H so that it reads, excuse me, um, any electronic or mechanical equipment uh, when sharing a property line with an R zone shall be enclosed in structures designed with noise attenuating features by a licensed acoustical engineer. So again, the intent was not to broadly throughout the CM zone require an onerous sound attenuating apparatus, but, but when we're having properties share a line with residential. Um, so I think that motion would help clarify the limited few instances where that would apply. So it'd be an amendment, uh, correct? It would. Or, yeah, okay. So uh, any questions or comments? So. Thank you. That's been moved and seconded uh, with no objections, so so ordered. Thank you. Next item number five. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> item five, Councilman, is a zone change motion again for the construction of a 49 unit multifamily development in CD3. Thank you. Um, let's, item number five. Okay, we can move that. There's uh, no public speaking cards. Any objections? No objections, so ordered. Okay, item number six, we have one card. Sure. Um, um, we could go into item number six, please. Sure, Councilman, item six is a zone change ordinance. It's to construct a nine one-story, rather nine sing one-story single-family homes in CD15. Staff here on this item? Uh, just a quick overview of this item, please. Good afternoon, Michelle Singh with the Department of City Planning. The request before you is a recommended action from the Harbor Area Planning Commission to approve a zone change from an R1 to an RD5 zone that would allow the construction of nine affordable single family homes in the Wilmington community uh, to be developed by Habitat for Humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Patricia McAllister. I oppose this. I think we should have more development in South Central. As I drive around Los Angeles, I see tons of construction of housing, all in areas that are non-African-American. We do have African-Americans in this city who pay taxes. 
and who've been living here for generations. And we should not be building affordable government. Ms. McAllister, l let me hold you there and please hold her time. Uh, you need to speak. Uh, you come here to these meetings often. I see you're at a lot of meetings. Uh, you are aware that you need to speak to the item on the agenda yeah, on this particular project before us today. Generalities, um, you, know, you could do that in public comment, but on this okay. particular item, we need you to speak on this item. Thank okay. you. Okay, I am against this 59,178 square uh, feet vacant lot that's going to have housing built on it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No. Any objection to moving this? No objections. So ordered. Thank you. Item number eight. Sure. Um, item eight, Councilman, this is a CEQA appeal in CD4. Actually, um, we're going to continue that to uh, December 8th. Okay. Uh, we could continue that item. And then we could go on to item number 10, please. Sure. Item 10, Councilman, is a hardship exemption uh, by Mr. Kusul Patel. It's for a property at 10450 Dunlear Drive in CD5. Thank you. Staff here on this item, please. Uh, I believe this is the item, Councilman, where the application was withdrawn. The application what? Was withdrawn. Oh, it was withdrawn? Yes, sir. Okay, so we will, uh, what's the appropriate uh, disposal uh, of this Adrian item? Horsani City Attorney's Office, I would recommend you still take an action. My understanding is that they failed to file their affidavits, so you do have grounds for a denial. As an okay, so uh, w with no objection, we will uh, deny this application. Okay. And uh, let's go back to item number four, please. Sure. Um, item four, Councilman, this is... Uh, a zone change in CD1. This is for the construction of a CVS drugstore. Staff here on this item, please. Is staff here on item number four? There he is. Okay. Thank you. I apologize, Councilman. I missed the uh, queue here. Uh, my name is Frank Kwan. I'm with the Los Angeles City Planning Department uh, Expedited Processing Unit. Uh, before you is a zone change approval for a, a TQCM-1 and TQC2-1VL zones for the South uh, Los Angeles Area Planning Commission, uh, which acted on this case at their August 4th meeting. Uh, the commission did approve and recommend approval. Uh, along with this uh, entitlement package were other entitlements including a conditional use and uh, a variance as well. The project at hand is a 16,600 square foot CVS pharmacy to be constructed on the 65,000 square foot uh, South LA uh, community plan site. Uh, the project is located at the southwest corner of Washington and Hoover and uh, be ha more than happy to answer questions. However, I think there's a submittal for, from the local council office uh, who would like, is interested in uh, making some modifications to condition uh, T1 under the T conditions. So uh, be happy to answer any questions on that. Great, thank you. Patricia McAllister. I am familiar with these areas here, and I oppose having a 24-hour operations of a drugstore, which we know they sell drugs, so you will be having addicts in the area and alcoholics. You wouldn't dare go to Fairfax around in those areas, La Brea, and open up something like this. 24 hours. We don't need any more alcoholics in this city. We need alcohol prevention and housing. So I am against this on Hoover Street, uh, we're familiar with these streets. West Washington, they have enough drugs and alcohol in these areas. It's all being done for profit. You're not trying to help anybody. You wouldn't dare propose something like this in the Jewish community. Thank you. Sergio Infanson from Council District 1. Good afternoon. Um, 
Sergio Infanzón representing the uh, Office of Council Member Cedillo. Uh, we are here requesting the committee to amend you know, certain BOE conditions. We met with the applicant, we met with BOE, and they concur. I have a copy of um, the letter requesting these uh, changes. So that you can have it on the record. And uh, we truly believe that this is gonna be uh, for betterment of the, the city, the improvements that uh, we were discussed with BOE. So uh, we hope that um, you can accept these the changes. Okay, thank great, you. thank you. Yeah, uh, staff? On this, have you had a chance to look at these uh, proposed amendments? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have. They are consistent with um, uh, basically our newly adopted mobility plan, which uh, policy allows them to uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, play in terms of not doing as much street widening as we can. And uh, I believe in this case, because there is so much frontage over the site, it, uh, the project actually fronts on four streets and uh, provides uh, uh, an extensive amount of curb and street frontage to improve and therefore becomes a, a, co a costly situation, uh, according to the applicant. And uh, in accordance with the mobility plan, which permits us to look at uh, uh, these situations with a, li a little more leniency, um, we could analyze the proportionality of the actual development, which is uh, uh, much less than what was on the pro uh, project uh, site before, and uh, equate that to probably less um, street improvement here. Okay, thank you. Any objection to moving this item forward? No. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Thank you. So ap approve as amended, right? Approve as amended, yes, Thanks. with the amendment says provided to this committee uh, by Council District 1. Item number seven. Um, item seven, Councilman, this is a general plan amendment and a zone change and along with a modified parking district in CD4. I mean, excuse me, in CD12. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll approve this item um, without any objections. Sure, Mr. Englander. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank the community for coming Please together in support of this as, as well as the, uh, the applicant. And for those that um, have been following this at all, there's actually been some, some media generated on this uh, project on how positive it is. This is something new and unique that the city of Los Angeles has actually never done. Um, and it's really been the vision and, um, and the brainchild of, uh, of the Larian family who's here today. Uh, the idea is to build uh, a center where, and, and if you can imagine this, where you can live, work, and play all at the same location, where you can have housing on site for employees, as well as some retail to service that, but also entertainment and cultural venues, where you can have outdoor theaters and music for all of those employees and their families, as well as a play area, a gathering place for the community, uh, and then the idea that you could work there as well in harmony, and there's nothing like this. Um, a lot of people look at the model of the Google campus uh, and places outside of Los Angeles that try to come close, don't even come close to holding a candle to the imagination um, and what this project is going to bring here, not only in terms of opportunity, employment, and economic development, but the uniqueness and the opportunity of this project. I really want to thank um, particularly the planning department, building and safety, and all the folks that have been involved in this, uh, including the mayor directly. Uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti was involved in the very first meeting on this, as well as all the different general managers who have touched this project and done it so in record time. Uh, and so I want to thank um, both the applicant's team as well as his family that had this vision in, in, in pursuing this and uh, ask all of you to vote yes. And then, as soon as we cut the ribbon, ask all of you to come out and check out something very unique to Los Angeles and hopefully we can expand that type of concept to a lot of other communities where you can imagine you don't have to get in your car two hours away from your family to go to work, uh, but you just wake up and put on your slippers and go downstairs. Uh, that kind of opportunity where after school you can go and do homework with your kids um, and then go simply walk right back upstairs or, 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 or to the next building. Um, and uh, after going downstairs and having a sandwich, and go right back to work if you so choose. And so that kind of family atmosphere is, is, is really revolutionary here in Los Angeles. And I'm very excited to support this project. Thank you. Thank you.
you. Seeing none, so ordered. Okay. Item number one. <clears throat> Item one, Councilman, is a report from the CAO um, relative to the development reform initiative. Uh, Mr. Jason Kalin is here from the CAO. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. Jason Kalin, Office of the City Administrative Officer. Um, before you today is the status report on the development reform initiative. This is the first status report of the current fiscal year. Um, so what our office is doing is recommending um, one-time appropriations to operating budgets to implement some of the recommendations included in the report. Um, this committee and the council adopted a matrix report and CAO report in April 2014, which included over 300 recommendations to improve the um, provision of development services within the city of Los Angeles. Um, we are in year two of that initiative, and the departments have been provided through the budget process a number of resources, um, which will expand conditional use compliance um, and monitoring provisions within the planning department and the departments of building and safety. Um, it provided an appropriation to implement Build LA. We anticipate the departments coming forth with um, a status report within the next 60 days to update um, this committee on the status of the contract negotiations and the new phasing plan for that project. Um, we also have planning department implementing geographic teams, um, which will provide for um, not only community-based planning, but development service-related planning within um, three geographic uh, areas throughout the city and the opening of the West LA Development Services Office later this fiscal year. Um, the appropriation for the CAO's office will provide monies to continue um, funding for the contractor through the end of the current fiscal year to continue implementing those recommendations. Um, myself and staff are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Well, colleagues, go ahead. Mr. Englander. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple questions. One, first and foremost, on the fee schedule that's attached. Um, are these all due fees or updated fees for cost recovery? All of the fees included in the attachments are existing fees with the exception of applying a systems development surcharge, which is a 7% surcharge um, in attachment B under miscellaneous. Okay, and so with that, and looking at the fee schedule, I'm opening it now, here it is. Um, and so with that, these are updating the fee schedule, is that correct? Correct. So I'm, and I think maybe that I'm reading it incorrectly, and so if you can walk me through it for a second. Because what it has here is, these are the newest, newest updated fee schedule or the current? This is the recommended fees for each of these sections within the existing code and ad code. So I think maybe my version, or I'm, I'm just reading it wrong, I'm trying to find what the difference is between what the change is, what, what the actual fee is now, and what being proposed. Because right now it just has the project size threshold, the base cost of threshold size, and the cost for each additional 100 square feet. What I'm not seeing is the current versus proposed, so the differential. That is not, the, the current fees are not included in the report. Um, when the city attorney prepares the ordinance, typically our office prepares a staff report in support of that ordinance. We can show the current fees versus the proposed fees in the, um, the second CA report associated with that. So we're not being asked to vote on a new schedule today, is that correct? Um, the, you're not being asked to approve a new schedule today. Um, we would have the city attorney uh, draft an ordinance that which would come back through the approval process and would have a CAO report associated with that, which would show the table for the current fees versus the proposed fees. And is that going to then come back to Plum first before it goes to council? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so that was one question. I guess my other question is, um, on all of these fees, one of the things we often hear from applicants is that they have to submit a check to, for, for every other department and they have to send somebody down. Oftentimes, just the courier service or the messenger service or the time to take an entire day off of work to go down to submit a check and then they have to turn around and maybe write one for another department somewhere else and not the ability to do so online like so many other municipalities have that capability for. Um, where is that in this process and is that identified in the report as well? Um, with the Build LA process, we'll be having a citywide portal, which will um, actually implement 
um, all of our development services and permitting applications for all the various departments into a single wide portal. Um, as part of that, we'll have a universal cashiering module so that applicants would be able to pay for all of the associated fees in one transaction and they wouldn't have to go to multiple city departments to submit fees. And they'll be able to do so online? Um, that, yes, sir. Okay, and what's the timeline for that? Um, phase one is expected to be implemented sometime in January of 2016 and it will take approximately two and a half years to fully implement Bill Delay. So two and a half years for phase one? Um, two and a half years for the entire project. Phase one will take somewhere between 12 and 18 months. And so is, we the on, is the online portal part of phase one? Correct, sir. Okay. The portal is part of phase one. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues ask, uh, uh, first I want to thank the CAO for their report and presentation. Um, we're almost there with other evaluations uh, with DOT and BOE and a number of other agencies are still remaining, but I think we've done some great uh, work on this uh, and ask that, with, uh, that we move on this item. Thank you. Thank you. No objection? So ordered? Okay, thank you. Item number one. Uh, th that was item one, I'm Council. So, I'm sorry, that was item one. Got that. Item nine. Well, item nine, Councilman, it's a hardship exemption application by Philip Kang uh, for the property at 513 North. Plymouth Boulevard in CD4. Okay. Staff here on this item? Hi, Council Members. Julia Duncan, Councilman David Rue's office. Um, we're requesting that you approve the hardship exemption for Mr. Philip Kang at 513 North Plymouth. Plymouth, um, there's financial and emotional hardship for the family living at the residence. They're requesting a modest addition of 870 square feet at the rear of their home. The height of the home would not change, neither would the front of the home. Um, not only have they done the notices per the new um, requirements of the hardship application, but we've also requested that Philip King go and secure our letters of support from all of the abutting neighbors to his property in addition to the properties across the street. And we'd like you to approve this hardship application today. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this item? No. So for the request of CD4, we will um, approve the exemption. Any other questions or comments? Any objections? So ordered. Next item, please, is item number two, correct? Uh, sure, Councilman. Item two is the proposed uh, cleanup, green up draft ordinance uh, submitted by the Planning Commission. Welcome, Ms. Staff here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members. My name is Hagu Salman Kerry with the Department of City Planning, and I'm here to present on Clean Up Green Up. This is a culmination of a two year work program led by the Department of City Planning in collaboration with other departments and agencies, as you'll hear shortly, um, and really the culmination of over six years' worth of community engagement and participation. Clean Up Green Up is a multi-pronged initiative uh, with two key components, a regulatory piece and support service piece. Collectively, these two halves are the uh, really aim to address in small part environmental justice issues happening locally. From the regulatory perspective, Clean Up Green Up aims to address cumulative health impacts resulting from incompatible land uses and an overconcentration of pollution burden in three main areas in our city. Those are Pacoima Sun Valley, Boyle Heights, and Wilmington. To provide a little bit of background, um, these three communities have had a legacy of incompatible land uses. What you'll often find on the ground is um, manufacturing or commercial zoning directly adjacent to residential zones with sensitive receptors such as daycares, schools, and homes. These incompatible land use patterns really have livability, health, and wellness impacts and are really well documented by our state's Environmental Protection Agency. Cali PA's environmental health screening tool known as CalEnviroScreen um, shows that these three communities in Los Angeles have high, some of the highest pollution burden scores across 19 varied indicators which range from socioeconomic status to criteria pollutants. 
Communities that score high on the CalEnviro screen um, are known as disadvantaged communities. And this analysis done by the EPA's um, scientists, the Office of Health Hazard Assessments, have paved the way for priorita prioritizing money from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund under AB 32 to be spent specifically in these disadvantaged communities under SB 535. Needless to say, there's been a lot of attention from the state level on communities that have been historically overburdened by these issues. And this initiative has also received a lot of attention from various organizations, counties, um, and cities in and out of California. Um, many cities across the nation are confronted with an increasing urbanization urbanized population juxtaposed with historical um, industrial land uses, and many of them are looking to LA for innovative ideas on solving these problems while also maintaining a balance for environmental justice, jobs, and livability. As the planning department, we have focused um, on what we can effectuate within our land use authority. Before, t before you today is a supplemental use district that proposes land use development standards that buffer, protect, and minimize the impacts from one use to another. The development standards address things like site planning, setbacks, enclosures, and landscape buffers, which, apply, which are applied very contextually and to certain new construction, additions, and major improvement projects, as well as, as, well as change of use one concrete example of what's in the proposal before you is the requirement that a manufacturing uh, a property on a manufacturing zone have a setback when adjacent to a property such as a house, a school, a daycare, or other um, such uses where there's currently no such requirement. Another such example has to do with um, walls being built between manufacturing and commercial zones when adjacent, again, to a house, a school, or a daycare. These types of um, requirements are applied in very limited scenarios and really sh fall short of what's required in these overburdened communities. Where the Department of City Planning did not have authority, we forged new partnerships with other regulatory agencies. Knowing that mobile source emissions is a major problem in all three of the geographies, we partnered with the California Air Resources Board and before you in the, in the supplemental use district is a signage requirement that asks that new, pro new projects with commercial trucking um, install a no idling sign enforcing the state's laws. The partnership with California Air Resources Board yields free signage to our applicants um, provided by CARB. On other issues where the planning and zoning chapter of the our Los Angeles Municipal Code um, where, where other um, zoning issues weren't relevant, we've turned to other parts of the municipal code um, and worked with our Department of Building and Safety. I'll turn the mic over now to Osama Yunin from Building and Safety to discuss some of the building code changes uh, that are proposed before you now. Good afternoon, Council members. Uh, my name is Osama Union with Building and Safety. Um, in this ordinance, there's a couple of requirements that pertain to uh, Department of Building and Safety. The main one is the requirement of a MERV 13 for buildings within 1,000 feet of a freeway. That was one of the recommendations that planning came up with in their stakeholder meetings. But since it involves mechanical systems in buildings, we thought it was best suited to be put in the mechanical code rather than being planning case conditions of approval or in the zoning code that would make it easier from enforcement and implementation. Uh, the MERV 13, we do see it now in, uh, as mitigation measures in discretionary projects, but if it's not in the code, it makes it difficult for us to follow whether it exists or not. So putting it in the mechanical code, we believe is, is a better way from enforcement and implementation perspective. Thank you. Great, so the requirement in the building code that Osama covered is a citywide standard, um, whereas the other supplemental use district regulations are in those three geographies I previously mentioned. The building, uh, the building code amendment to the MERV filters is citywide within 1,000 feet of a freeway and two other citywide standards have been proposed under Clean Up Green Up. One requires um, that new and physically expanding refineries obtain oil refineries um, re 
uh, obtain a conditional use permit. The second requires a wider notification radii for um, projects within a surface mining district. Altogether, there are three citywide requirements um, and then several that are applicable to those three geographies. Um, lastly, and somewhat in many ways important, most importantly, Clean Up Green Up is um, responsible for creating a unique position within the city to support greener business practices in the three geographies. Um, this position is affectionately known as the Clean Up Green Up Ombuds person, but will formally take the title of Environmental Affairs Officer. The components of Clean Up Green Up, um, this component of Clean Up Green Up is exciting and innovative in that for the very first time, the city will target, provide targeted support services to businesses in these three disadvantaged communities. This focused effort will likely lay the foundation for receiving additional funds under SB 535, like I previously mentioned. The job description and metrics of this, um, of the six metrics for success of this position have been well thought out to the extent possible. They have now been passed on to the mayor's office where the position has been funded for the fiscal year 2015-2016 budget. All this work that I'm um, syn synopsizing quickly for you has been made possible by the robust and kind of rigorous community and stakeholder engagement process that's taken place over the last two years but not for the over 15 individual stakeholder meetings on all sides of the issue, three outreach meetings with over 150 participants collectively, three staff hearings, one in each of the three communities, and 10 different departments, divisions, and agencies, we would not have the high caliber ordinance before you. The varied opinions of the stakeholders who have been actively engaged in this process, evidenced by the numerous letters in the council file management system, and I'm sure you'll hear of from today, have created an informed and a rigorous process. We have worked with organizations ranging from SCAMF, Pacoima Beautiful, Air Resources Board, Communities for a Better Environment, Western States Petroleum Association, USC Peer Program, BIA, Liberty Hill Foundation, Chamber of Commerce, Occidental College, Union de Vecinos, Chamber of Commerce from Wilmington, and Communities for a Safe Environment, as well as SEEB and Cali PA. The list goes on. In summary, the Clean Up Green Up initiative is a new opportunity to respond to some of the most challenging issues facing disadvantaged communities in Los Angeles. Building consensus around what exactly that approach looks like has been challenging but very rewarding. Approval of the regulations will allow for the hire of the ombudsperson and the protection of incompatible land uses in these three communities, providing more equity in land use planning and creating a more livable community in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to a public comment now, unless there's some immediate questions or comments. So, um, Carol Liu from CD515, do you wish to go now or at the end of the public comments from Council District 15? At the end? Okay. So, uh, Patricia McAllister? This is public comment, right? This but is public comment for item number two. Oh, yes. I, 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 I support number two. I lived near a freeway, was coughing daily, uh, smut all over the window. After I moved, the coughing stopped. So, yes, we need these filters. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll go to uh, Ruben Gonzalez. Uh, we've been asked, they submitted a number of cards, and um, whenever there's a number of cards for the interest of time, uh, we uh, could allot the 10 minutes uh, to speak on that, uh, on this item. Uh, and then uh, we'll go to the rest of the cards. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Would you like the cards? Yeah, just uh, if you could give them to her. That's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ruben Gonzalez. I'm here on behalf of both the LA Area Chamber of Commerce uh, as well as the 20 member industry coalition that has been engaged in this issue and uh, written several letters that uh, you have on file. We all support limiting emissions in these communities. We all support a better environment in these communities. Um, in fact, when this uh, idea was first begun five or six years ago, we were working hand in hand to move forward on it. But the reality is that the ordinance before you does not meet those goals. Baseline. 
when we started this years ago, and, and many of uh, our chairman and, and some other council members stood at a press conference, what was said was, in these communities, many of these businesses are small. They do not have the ability, the capital, or the knowledge to improve their operations. So we are going to set up two prongs. One, for good acting companies, we are going to set up an incentive program and an ombudsman to help them learn how to have cleaner operations. And we are going to have a better mechanism of enforcement of books, of rules already on the books so that bad actors can be um, cited and again, shown how to improve their operations to reach those better emission, better quality of life goals for these impacted communities. The ordinance before you today does none of that. Let me say it again. The ordinance before you today does none of that. Instead, what it does is put another regulatory overlay for businesses in these areas that will make it harder to make their operations cleaner. It will make it harder because it will make it more costly. And so the practical outcome of this ordinance as it is placed is that businesses will not choose to upgrade their facilities. They will not have access to the help to find potential grants and incentives out there to upgrade their facilities. And in the end, we will see no improvement to emissions. And even if you disagree with me on that, there's no way to tell because there is zero infrastructure or resources in this ordinance or plan to measure whether emissions lower under this new regime. How can you manage, test, or track, or know if you've had success if there is zero measurement involved? Secondly, to increase enforcement on current rules or even the ones that are trying to be introduced now. There is zero infrastructure in place, increased resources, more inspectors at all to be able to enforce current rules on the books or the ones being proposed right now. Further, there is only a vague ombudsman seat set in the mayor's office that only was given one year of budget funding for this past year it is not an independent office, as ombudsmen inherently tend to be. It is a political seat, a political staffing. We don't know what it would look like, how it would be managed, how the person would be chosen to be in that position, nor after all of these years is there a list of incentives created by an ombudsman that, again, doesn't still exist, or put forth that currently exist at various levels of government that businesses might take advantage of, let alone any proposed new incentives that could help these small businesses in these areas have the capital to actually meet the goals that were out in the rhetoric when this was first introduced. You know, the, the letters of support that are, folks are talking about on file now, look at the dates on some of them. Many of them are back in 2012 and 2013, back when we were still talking about incentive and enforcement-based regulation, not this new planning overlay. So how do you judge good public policy? Does it meet the stated goals? This does not. Is it able to be measured for success? This does not. Is there a structure or, or, or resources in place to enforce it? It does not. So what do you have? You have an attempt to target certain businesses and make it more difficult for them to do their job to create jobs, to create economic activity, and to have their regular form of business. Now, if you want to have a discussion about not liking certain industries, let's do that and let's have it out in the open. But let's not take what was supposed to be a positive incentive-based partnership to clean communities and back into an attack on certain other industries. Now, there's been a lot of talk by staff about a great outreach process. It's not really an outreach process, a partnership, or a listening process when none of the concerns of those being regulated, the industries under this, those who need to, the help to clean up their shops, are ignored completely. This process might have started a few months ago because the first place where that listening happened was at the CPC, the Planning Commission. And they made some significant changes to the original ordinance proposed by staff. But to call us, the chamber or any of the industry associations represented partners 
is just completely false. Were we in a room? Yes. Did we speak? Yes. Was anything we said reflected or any of our concerns raised answered? No, they were ignored. So we are grateful to the planning commission for make, taking some of the thorns off of this uh, ineffective product. We are hoping that this committee and the council will do more to get this back, ideally to get this back to what it was meant to be. And if you can't do that, at the very least, as, as what the doctor tried to do no harm, we would ask, first of all, that for the CUP process, which has been an overlay on certain industries which are already well regulated by AQMD and other agencies that have hearing process and a community process and assessment process, we would ask that if you cannot remove the CUP, at a minimum, reduce its requirements and bring it to a level where it is managed by a zoning administrator with an appeal to the APC and not directly to a planning commission. Second, and probably the most egregious uh, issue we're looking at now, is the introduction of the health impact assessment. This is a model that is not used anywhere else in the United States to success. It is not an accepted tool for looking at health risks. We have the health risk assessment, which is in state law, which is used by AQMD in many of their regulations, which is part of the CEQA process. And if you feel that this law must have an assessment in it, then please remove the HIA, which again is unproven, hasn't been used. You would be the canary in the coal mine using this. It is a qualitative, subjective process that gives nothing to actually make decisions to you have to make these tough decisions. Whereas a health risk assessment, again, is used throughout the state of California, is codified into state law in the CEQA process, is used by AQMD. Industry and community groups are familiar with it and know how to work that process. There isn't any sort of process behind the HIA. It is a black hole. The one time it was attempted locally for a 710 working group, it took three years to try to complete it, and then it was tossed in the garbage and never used. It is not a proven model. Please remove it and add the HRA if you must have an assessment in this extra overlay. And finally, I would ask that if you cannot hold this in committee, which we would say is ideal, but must pass something through, hold back any implementation of any ordinance passed until at least July 1, 2016, when a new budget goes into effect. And in the time between now and then, require city staff to study and come forth with a plan for how an ombudsman would actually work, how it would be funded, how it would be independent, where it should be housed, and how it will be ongoing and not just at the whims of budget to budget. Have them come forward with that original enforcement plan that, uh, that says we're gonna enforce the bad, rules against the bad actors and then tell them how they can get uh, to be good corporate citizens. Create incentives from the city you have the tools, you have the opportunities to waive fees, to give holidays for business tax. Those are just a few ideas and more than any that have been brought up by staff in this process or been proposed to you in this. And let us wait until July 1, 2016 because by then we will be through the next budget process and we will know whether we can have funding for the positions and the resources necessary to make the original vision of Clean Up Green Up a reality. We are not opposed to cleaning up the, these communities. We are not opposed, opposed to challenging businesses to do the right thing. But all this will do in the end is ensure that these small businesses represented by, by the chairman, by Councilman Fuentes, by Councilman Buscano, will not put any investment in to clean up their operations because you're actually making it harder for them to do so if you pass what is on paper right now. So we implore you to stop, return to the original vision, and let's do this right. I thank you for your time. Thank you. I'll call up uh, three people at a time um, with a minute each. Manuel Pastor, Michelle Schultz-Wood, and Veronica Padilla. Good morning, good afternoon. I'll try to do this quickly. Uh, the ordinance that you have in front of you actually emerges from a great deal of science 
in terms of the development of environmental justice screening methods that were the uh, undergirding for Cal and Virus Train, which is how the greenhouse gas emissions are being handed out and used to identify these communities of concern. It's been a community-driven process in which the communities uh, in the three areas have participated in both doing science through ground truthing and also in giving their recommendations for the ordinance. It has engaged uh, local businesses, and you'll hear a little bit about that from a local business. And there's been attention to what we think the issues of conversion might be. It's a pilot program, so it is going to give you an opportunity to assess whether this works and what modifications you need to do uh, moving forward in terms of design. And then finally, much like the minimum wage uh, ordinance in uh, the city, much like the action on climate change, this is something being watched by the rest of the nation. The US EPA is very interested in this green zones concept, as is the California Environmental Protection Agency. This is another opportunity for the city of Los Angeles to lead. Thank you. Michelle Schultzwood, Veronica Padilla, and Ashley Hernandez. Hello, I'm Michelle Schultzwood. I'm here representing the California Air Resources Board. The ARB has adopted many rules to work to reduce exposure to diesel exhaust in communities to protect human health, and we actively enforce those rules. We're also actively working with community groups throughout the state to address their concerns, especially as it pertains to diesel exhaust and other issues. We're happy to have had the opportunity to support the City of LA's Clean Up Green Up program. LA is the first to codify this idling prevention partnership in support of the program, ARB has committed to provide no idling signs for use in communities where idling is an issue. Additionally, we're happy to discuss, discuss other ways in which we can support, um, we can be supportive and helpful. And we've been very pleased with the partnership that has developed between our two agencies and look forward to cooperating in the future to address the city's needs. Thanks very much. Thank you. Veronica Padilla, Ashley Hernandez, Adam Lane. Good afternoon, my name is Veronica Padilla. I'm the Executive Director of Pacoima Beautiful. Pacoima Beautiful has worked to protect the health of our residents for over 19 years now. Our community members have been working on this policy for over six years. This began from the ground up in our community, waking up at 5 a.m., counting trucks, diesel trucks, and taking air quality samples. Pacoima Beautiful joined our other organizations from two other hotspot communities, Unión de Vecinos in Boyle Heights, Communities for a Better Environment, and Coalition for a Safe Environment in Wilmington to support Clean Up Green Up, and you'll hear from them a little later. These three communities are among the worst ranking under the Cal Enviro Screen Tool that the state has to evaluate communities that are disproportionately burdened by multiple sources of pollution. We have many community members here today that support Clean Up Green Up, and I'd like to ask them to please stand. Si podían levantarse, si apoyan Clean Up Green Up. And I will end quickly um, by thanking the city, uh, city Planning Department for all their work. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Hernandez, Adam Lane, and <clears throat> yeah, that's it for now. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Ashley Hernandez. I am a Wilmington resident, and I am also a community organizer with Communities for a Better Environment. I am here to talk to you all about my support with Clean Up Green Up. I've seen this initiative grow as a volunteer in high school. I have seen many people sign petitions um, in fear of what... Um, they believe uh, is in, and we all know is going to affect us right living in a community overburdened with pollution i've seen the businesses the small businesses um, that we have talked to um, talk about a, a, a new relationship that they want to build with the city a new business that they want a new sustainable um, a community that we all really need it's imperative for all of us to have clean up green up here this is a first step and we really need this in our community especially in wilmington um, living within all these um, industries um, mobile and non-mobile it's something that we really need to see we really need something really great in our communities and seeing the support grow just solidifies my support here and I thank you all thank you Adam Lane Isaac Luna and Stephen Leonido John good afternoon my name is Adam Lane I'm here representing the Los Angeles Business Council in support of the cleanup green up ordinance the proposed new performance standards in the ordinance will help address issues arriving over from the proximity of incompatible land uses and certain sources of pollution in three of LA's most polluted communities 
We are supportive that the initiative seeks to combine economic incentives and business assistance while streamlining permitting and resolving regulatory and code conflicts to help businesses and building owners invest in improvements that will create value while mitigating negative environmental and health impacts. The strategy will help businesses capitalize on the array of city, state, and federal incentives available to them. We're also highly supportive of the proposed OMSBUD person position, which will support businesses in navigating and complying with regulations and assist them in finding available financial support that they are unaware of. It is crucial this position works closely with partners such as LADWP, SoCal Gas, and LAEDC, among others, to target existing incentive programs in these communities. We're encouraging staff and city to improve efforts to identify businesses that operate without proper permits and provide clarity to those who do operate responsibly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Isaac Luna, Stephen Leonido John, and Jesse Marcus. Hi, my name is Isaac Luna. I'm a business owner from the community of Pacoima and a strong supporter of Clean Up Green Up. My business opened in 1972 and is still operating. My facility is environmentally built. Three clarifiers that collect and save substance to keep them away from our strain dorms and our, the ocean. Our paint is a water-based paint free from lead and VOCs. A year ago, I was invited to Pacoima Beautiful to a green, Guide to Green Up workshop where I was introduced to DWP Energy Efficient Lighting Program. My facility now has an energy efficient lighting. I'm also proud to say that my business is a facility, facility is a, a green business certified by the City of Los Angeles Business Program. Clean Up Green Up would create a city office to help businesses find this kind of support on a permanent basis. I strongly believe that the businesses are the life of the community. Better businesses create better jobs that lead to better communities. We need your support. I would um, hand out to you today the signatures of local businesses that support Green Up, Clean Up, Green Up program. Clean Up, Green Up will help us achieve a better community. Let's all go green. Thank you. Stephen Leonido, Jesse Marquez, and Andrea Rico. Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Leonido John. I'm the director of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Region 9 Field Office based here in Los Angeles. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Earlier this year, EPA Regional Administrator Jared Blumenfeld wrote to the City Council and to the Planning Commission with the message that the Clean Up, Green Up approach under consideration here today complements and strengthens EPA's environmental and public health protection efforts in Los Angeles. As you are aware, EPA works with city, state, federal, and private partners to protect the environment and public health in our communities. Currently, EPA is part of a multi-agency state-led Los Angeles Environmental Justice Enforcement Initiative for a targeted enforcement and compliance effort in Boyle Heights and Pacoima. This initiative and the Clean Up Green Up effort to create more health protective standards in LA communities will go a long way to, to meaningfully address toxic pollution and the public health excuse me, problems associated with cumulative environmental impacts. Other Clean Up Green Up measures that build on state and federal efforts to prevent exposure to toxic air pollution include signage to deter diesel truck idling and requirements to install high air quality filters in new if you could wrap it up, please. residential communities. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Marquez, Andrea Rico, Bill Gallagher. Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Marquez. I'm a longtime, lifetime resident of Wilmington. I'm also the founding director of the Coalition for a Safe Environment. We are now over 14 and a half years servicing our community and various needs. And I want to bring your attention to some letters I'm passing out to you. These are representatives out there who support us. We're talking about U.S. Congresswoman Janice Hahn, who was a former councilman here, who was one of the co-sponsors with Councilman Jose Wieser on this proposition. There's also a letter by Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO, that they support what we're doing. There's also the California Environmental Protection Agency letter that supports us, and the State of California Auto Dismasters Association. So these are organizations that we've communicated with, that we work with, that understand our community needs. And I'll close by stating that the gentleman that mentioned health impact assessments has not done his homework. I can provide you over 100 examples of successful applications of a health impact assessment. So if you wish to see those, I'd be more than happy to share what cities, what counties, what government agencies have used them very successfully. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Rico, Bill Gallagher, Mark Mihura, Mihara. 
Hi, and thank you. Um, my name is Andrea Rico, and I'm on the faculty at the USC Keck School of Medicine. I'm here today to express how significant a problem exposure to near roadway air pollution is, especially for our most vulnerable residents, children and the elderly. So I'm here to speak about the 1,000 foot setback and the um, need for filters in that area. Studies at USC, UCLA and from around the world have shown that growing up near freeways and heavy traffic pollution is linked to health problems during pregnancy, lower birth weight, premature babies for women who live near freeways when they're pregnant, children whose lungs don't grow as well as they should, higher rates of asthma, and the studies also show that adults living near busy roads um, and traffic and freeways are more likely to develop heart disease or stroke or to have memory problems as they age. In an ideal world, we would not build housing in close proximity to freeways, but if we continue to allow that, then other appropriate actions such as filters are definitely necessary to protect residents from exposure to near roadway air pollution. And I'm, I have passed this out to some of you, this colorful flyer that shows what some of these health impacts are. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Gallagher, Mark Mihara, and Baram Fazeli. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Bill Gallagher, representing the California Nurses Association and the over 90,000 nurses across California uh, that we represent. We strongly support Clean Up Green Up because our nurses are actually at the front lines caring for patients that suffer from the adverse health, health effects of pollution. Nurses know from everyday experience what the Air Board has now confirmed for us that the residents of areas like Pacoima and Wilmington and Boyle Heights have a two to three times higher rate of risky, uh, risk of contracting pollution related illnesses such as asthma, heart disease, respiratory distress, cancer and premature death. Nurses see this reality every day, whether it's treating children that come in to an ER terrified because they can't breathe from an asthma attack or trying to soothe and comfort an elderly person coughing up blood. And we also see that these most vulnerable and low-income uh, residents are the least able to afford costly ER visits and hospital stays. For nurses, the first priority is the health of our patients and also along with that, basic environmental justice. We strongly urge your support for this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Mihara, Baram Fazeli. Hello. I am Mark Mihara from IQ Air, and I'm speaking in support of the proposed amendment to the Mechanical Code. My message is that it's not only possible to provide clean air for people living next to freeways, but it is reasonable as well. Please reference our letter dated uh, 23rd of October for further information. For the past seven years, IQ Air has been working with the South Coast AQMD to bring air filtration to schools located near refineries, ports, rail yards, and busy highways. Our MERV-16 rated high-performance air filters have been shown to dramatically reduce indoor air pollution levels to, for ultrafine particles and diesel soot by up to 90%. And we did that by upgrading the school's existing legacy HVAC systems, not installing expensive new hospital-grade HVAC equipment. So this is why we know that it is possible to provide a clean air safe haven for the inhabitants of buildings located close to freeways. There are actually a number of reasons why we would recommend going one step further and stepping up to the MERV-16 filters like the ones we used at the schools. But MERV-13 filters are definitely a step in the right direction to providing equal air quality for people who live and or work near busy highways. Thank you, Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Baram Fazeli, Elizabeth Blaney, Don Spivak. Thank you. My name is Bahram Fazeli, Policy Director for Communities for a Better Environment. On the issue of conditional use permits for the refineries, uh, conditional use permits are widely required for many industrial operations and other businesses in LA and are not required for refineries. One of the riskiest and most dangerous industrial operations uh, in the city of Los Angeles, while many other cities, five other cities in the LA County, require conditional use permits for the refineries. It is alarming and surprising that big oil has gotten away without having to prepare conditional use permits in the city of LA, and they can intensify and expand their operations by right. Oil executives have spent huge in their lobbying efforts to fight any regulation that provide more transparency, accountability, public participation, and safety for workers and fence line communities, even for modest asks like this one. Honorable members of the council and the committee, we ask you to support this provision and we ask you to strengthen it 
and add the trigger that deals with the intensification of operations within the refineries, Thank a you. trigger that is now missing from this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Blaney, Don Spivak, and Rebecca Liu. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Blaney. I'm with Union de Vecinos. Uh, I'm a resident also in Boyle Heights, one of the communities that are impacted by this. We support Clean Up Green Up and ask for your support in doing so. We're very excited about the opportunity, in particular, to partner with the local businesses. Uh, what uh, we have been doing a lot of work on is working with the local businesses, uh, having workshops with the local businesses about opportunities for them to get more resources. Uh, contrary to what the young man from the LA Chamber said, we do have the Boyle Heights Chamber of Commerce who endorsed this. We have over 100 local businesses who will be impacted by this who have endorsed and as well have posters hanging in their uh, in their businesses supporting this. Uh, one of the things in particular that they're very excited about is the ombudsman position. I understand that it, that is currently funded, so there is that infrastructure there. Uh, they're looking to have more of a streamlined support around the inspections and coordinated inspections because they're tired of one department saying one thing and another department saying another thing. And then also this opportunity to have grants and loans and somebody assisting them within that in the city. So we p support this uh, in having clean air for all. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Don Spivak, uh, Rebecca Liu. Good afternoon. Uh, Don Spivak, I'm a consultant with the community organizations that had been working very closely on moving this uh, program forward. Two points to make. One is that we very strongly endorse the idea of the ombudsman. We would certainly like to see more in that office. It's a start. We at the moment have, have nothing along those lines. So we need to get it started and start working on that. With regard to programs available to local businesses, as Mr. Luna pointed out, the Liberty Hill Foundation sponsored putting together a book called Guide to Green, which identifies 50 programs at the local, regional, state, and federal level that are available. We've been coordinating with a number of city departments, had workshops that a number of the council members have sponsored, where the different organizations that offer these programs have come out and businesses have begun signing up for assistance in various programs to help them clean up and green up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Becca Liu from Council District 15. Hello, Rebecca Liu. I'm a planning deputy for Councilman Buscaino's office. Um, Councilman Buscaino is very excited to see the Clean Up Green Up ordinance near completion. Um, he'd like to thank and acknowledge the city planning department for their dedication, as well as all the individual stakeholders and organizations who participated in the policy development. He's, he'd also like to thank the um, city planning commission for the attention, and he'd like to emphasize that he supports the conditional use permit with the revisions proposed by the city planning commission. Uh, today we have data that shows that whole neighborhoods of low-income families are disproportionately environmentally affected by a legacy of land use conflict. The goal of Clean Up Green Up is to minimize these impacts between residential and industrial uses, particularly in three heavily affected neighborhoods. There is one important piece currently missing from the ordinance. That is focused enforcement of current code and environmental regulations on existing businesses. This is a prime issue in Wilmington where the city's current resources and processes do not adequately address illegally operating industrial businesses or businesses that are non-compliant with environmental regulations. Addressing the disproportionate environmental impact of these neighborhoods is about more than setting up process for new and expanding projects. Clean Up Green Up needs to include the resources to work with existing businesses to ensure legal and environmentally compliant operations, not in a piecemeal fashion but in a truly proactive and comprehensive manner. Without this policy component, Clean Up Green Up will be complete. Um, the councilman would like to respectfully recommend that Plum do the following, approve the ordinances that comprise of Clean Up Green Up, and instruct the CL CAO and CLA in consultation with Department of Building and Safety and City Attorney to report back on resources needed to develop a program of proactive enforcement in the pilot zones of Boyle Heights, Pacoima, and Wilmington to ensure compliance of the current code and environmental regulations by existing businesses 
and to tackle unpermitted and illegal operations in the pilot zones. The report should include a staffing plan, budget, and funding sources, with the understanding that the ombudsperson would coordinate the work of the enforcement program. And um, I've brought a letter from Councilman Buscaino. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Mr. Fuentes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, maybe if the, the representative from Council District 15 doesn't go too far away, I've got a question. You mentioned that Councilmember Buscaino uh, is supportive of the CUP process, provided that the recommendations that the CPC made are adopted. What are th those aren't what's currently before us, is that right? They are? If, okay, let's have planning staff come on over here. So can you help me understand what those recommendations are? Absolutely. Hagu Salman Kerry for the record from the planning department. What's before you today, the conditional use permit for oil refineries is as amended by the CPC. Essentially, they removed one trigger and it stands, in their opinion, um, as the pro appropriate policy to move forward. Got it. Okay. I, I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, so. The, uh, and, and I actually, Mr. Chair, a am supportive of the motion that uh, the representative from Council Member 15's office made about uh, having a report back on additional financing and resources, or I should not financing, additional uh, public resources so that we can figure out how to fully staff the ombudsman position so that we can help transition these businesses. So. If it's okay with the chair, I'd be happy to make that motion, sure. provided that you'd support that. Okay, yes. We'll so l let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, but I, I have to preface them with, with a couple of statements, so forgive me for if I go a, a little bit longer. But, you know, I, I'm very excited about what this means for these three pilot areas, colleagues, uh, largely because these areas in the city of Los Angeles have little to no buffer and the impacts are severe. Representing one of these areas, I know full well just by anecdotal experience and as a result of my uh, stewardship to the district, I see each and every day where these uh, uh, interchanges between the built environment and the consequences of poor planning and not very good decision making, how they're impacting communities. And it's a, a short way to say that for whatever reason, corners of the city of Los Angeles have largely been ignored, or uh, there's been not very good representation. And this goes decades and decades and decades prior to any of our service in the community. So as a result, you have a challenge, and, and that challenge is how do you get from where we are today to a place that is more sustainable and healthy and resilient, and that's going to be hard. And so to, to that end, I'm absolutely sympathetic to the concerns that the representative from the chamber brought up. I, I do know that uh, it's very difficult, it's going to be very costly, um, but at the same time, doing nothing is no longer an option. So we're going to have to figure something out. And the way I see it, this is a very good start. And I think the representative from the chamber is actually very spot on about this. This regime is not going to be easy. But I don't know how it is that we get out from underneath the pressures of the consequences of poor planning and decision making unless we do something. And so looking through the ordinance, I think that uh, it's a good jump off for where it is that future development, knock on wood, will go and how it is that we begin to chip away at the challenges. Now I'm only speaking for my area and um, in the in Northeast San Fernando Valley because I've got the most familiarity with it. I don't know about Boyle Heights as much or Wilmington. But for my area, I think this would work. But I do have a couple of questions. I, I think it's a valid concern that Council Member Buscaino makes about wanting to make sure that we've got funding. And I think it's a fair question by the representative from the chamber. Why not have implementation start at the next fiscal year so that we can make sure that we've got the resources available so that if we are going to make the commitment to try to help pivot towards, uh, well not even pivot, help provide direction to those small businesses, preferably small businesses, to get to a better place, why not stagger the implementation? Point of clarification, Hagu, for the record. Um, implementation of the regulations or the ombudsperson? Uh, 
uh, well, the, uh, presumably if the resources are there, there's no reason to slow it down. But it was testified that the, the, the funding isn't there completely, at least not guaranteed for the next year. And Mr. Buscaino's motion, I think, is a good one. Let's make sure that we report back and have the resources available to actually mean what we say, which is we want to point these businesses to a cleaner future. Why not sort of syn synchronize all of it so that when the effective date of the ordinance and the ombudsman's resources are uh, matched up, start at that point and make it no later than July 1st of next year? Why not? Well, actually, the funding is in place right now for the ombudsperson. It's for the fiscal year that we're in currently, and I think um, the mayor's office is ready to go with the um, hire, and they've committed to fall, but waiting for, obviously, the regulations to pass so that the work program can build off of that. Um, in addition, the ordinance, in terms of its land use policies and its building and safety changes, really do stand on their own. They're really a baseline and a floor for what we should be doing for communities and through our analysis and comparison across the country this is by no means an excessive request in terms of what land use basic land use policy should do so in one hand those can live on their own independently and are a fundamental need for the incompatible land uses that we see in our post-industrial city but the funding is in place currently and I think by retaining that position and hiring, hiring them in the fall we can look at resources as um, that will help us kind of maintain funding and continue receiving funds. So, so here's where my fear comes is so in, in my committee uh, energy and environment Department of Water and Power have a tremendous crisis in a billion thing. Uh, we have the authority, we have the funding, but it takes six or seven months to hire somebody. How do we know that we're going to move very quickly on this ombudsman? Because to me, it's part and parcel to the success right. of this program. So I know that the funding's there, right. but for whatever reason in this town, the personnel department or whatever, right. uh, unless it's a political appointment and housed in the mayor's office, it seems to me that things move very slow. So is that exactly where this person, yes. I mean, we, as soon as, okay. All right. Yeah. So that, so and, I, it, and I think that was, if you don't mind me saying, uh, a strategic move on our part. Um, the mayor's office explicitly calls out Clean Up Green Up in their sustainability plan. Um, so they're very motivated. They've committed to, you know, getting someone on board as quickly as humanly possible within the city system, but they are um, within the but, mayor's office. Okay. But Mr. Uh, Fuentes, if you don't mind me asking one question because it's on point on this matter, and I, I was a part of the discussions as to where the ombuds person would be placed, but w can you tell me why it makes more sense to put it in the mayor's office versus building and safety, the right. planning department, or some other place that builds institutional knowledge that carries itself on no matter who's in office, and that there may be one mayor, we know this mayor is very proactive, environmental, very supportive, very issued, may be one of the priorities right now, but who knows if the next mayor may not put it as high of a priority. And not only that, um, you know, that institutional knowledge that needs to be built. It's a political appointment. Yeah. When new mayors come in, a lot, the whole administration moves out and the new administration moves in. It's also the issue. So what, how did the talk become, uh, what was the talk or the discussion that the decision was made to put in the mayor's office versus in some bureaucracy using a positive word <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> the little b. Yeah, Hagu for the record. Um, we debated this uh, at nauseum and I think the uh, the big idea was that there are so many programs that currently exist within the city, within the region, and within the state. What we were missing was one person with authority that could get the response and the engagement of those various agencies and organizations and programs and kind of connect the dots. So the decision was made along the way, and I think both sides have pros and cons to them, and we weighed them all. But there are so many programs existing currently that um, do provide incentives with those agencies, SoCal Gas, Edison, DWP, Green Business Program, and EWDC, uh, OneSource. So all these are disparate, um, and oftentimes when the ombudsperson is envisioned being in one of those agencies, it doesn't provide the leverage across all other agencies and all other even non-city departments. So it was a strategic approach and I think both had pros and cons. I, I've heard that argument before on many other issues. <laughs> if you apply that rationale, at every general manager should be in the mayor's office because um, because it's you know everything's a priority everything uh, we want somebody to be responsive that could get people across boards I've heard the same issue on homelessness and to me I do I, I feel strongly 
that we need a person within the bureaucracy to deal with homelessness because uh, you don't know if the next mayor is going to be as supportive as this mayor is. And so I, I'm just not convinced that that's the, the best place for for, for Neither this am I, position. Mr. Chair. And, and I mean, I, I don't want to slow this down, but I think as we get into the next budget season, it's a good conversation for us to have because hopefully the ombudsman has proximity to the bureaucracy to be able to effectuate the direction that small businesses or whomever needs a political appointment for better or for worse is a political appointment and so I, I, I don't want to admit this out loud but oftentimes w there isn't the, 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 the weight that you need to be able to get a department to move things sometimes when it's coming from an elected office. It needs to be ingrained in the institution to Mr. Weizar's point so how, how we hash that out I'm not sure but I, I also am not comfortable with the idea that it's a political appointment. But setting that aside for, for, for a second, let, let me, um, uh, I'll defer to the chair on how it is that we handle that. Um, but l let me sort of point out another thing that gives me uh, some, some pause here. You know, by and large, um, the folks that we're trying to remediate, I think th certainly the ones that need the most help are on the smaller side of things. There's clearly larger operations and larger businesses and, and you know, while it may not be welcome news, that is the cost of doing business. So if we're going to change the regulatory scheme, for better or for worse, that's the, the, the rule of law, and now it's time for folks to comply with it. But if the intention is to try to help the small business, the medium-sized business, I think that in the supplemental use uh, district that we're creating here, adding additional things to the code I don't think are helpful, and I think they're actually very expensive to a small business who wants to do the right thing. So the way it's mapped out, I think, in page 27 of the uh, proposed ordinance is that exemptions from all of this would uh, create a new process, and that new process would be that the exemption would be heard by the zoning administrator, which then is appealable to the city planning commission, and then is further appealable to the council, whereas the old process, I think, is a very good one. Appeal goes to the Area Planning Commission, and then it comes to the full city council. And so to me, I don't feel comfortable adding several layers of appeals if indeed what we're trying to do is compel action by small business. So, so I, I would ask, Mr. Chair, that, we, that we, we maintain the existing process, not to mention the Area Planning Commission it gives us proximity based on the fact that these pilots are geographic and they would know better than a citywide planning commission, with all due respect to the CPC, the needs of a small business in a, in a geography. Yes, and that was the original recommendation. Uh, it was changed at CPC. So what's before you, if I understand correctly, is uh, not the original recommendation. The exceptions on page 827 should be from APC on appeal to city council. Mr. Ch Mr. Fuentes is... I'm going to relinquish it now. <laughs> Normally, these types of appeals or standard reviews go to how it was originally written, correct? And particularly for supplemental use districts, appeals normally go through APC and then council review, not to, directly to the CPC, how they... Why would they do that? What was the rationale? Um, originally, actually, they wanted to go from the ZA to the CPC, so the appellate body was the CPC and the ZA would be the primary, um, you know, kind of inventory of the exception. Um, actually, that process does not end up before council. I think they did it because they wanted to see the project. As it stands now, the APC, which is the original appellate body and yeah. kind of geographically based, yeah. is the right CPCs one. are, I mean, I don't have the actual language in front of me, but they were created to deal with larger development projects, larger issues, policy issues. This is an appeal that we would normally see in an APC, not go directly to them. So I'm not quite sure why the CPC would want to see this level of detail at, at their level. It usually doesn't happen. It, it, it would maybe, uh, there's unconstitutional is the word when we use the Constitution. This would be a, against our charter, I, I think, in, in the way it was created. If we continue with the language uh, the, the way it is. Brent. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, it only happens in very few instances, none of which are for supplemental use districts, only for zoning adjustments, I believe, and multiple approvals. So I think, in fact, the original recommendation is the way to go forward. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Fuentes, I'm sorry. To no, uh, this is all very helpful, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you. No, so 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 uh, I'll uh, I'll stop at this point. But I I. Uh, I do think, though, that it's important for us to, at least from a budget perspective, try to understand how it is that we fortify the position of ombudsman. But for the time being, I'd be happy to uh, uh, move this at the appropriate time with the amendment uh, and request highlighted by Council District 15 in terms of a report back um, on the funding for the ombudsman and the amendment of uh, reverting back to the original version uh, on the process. Um, and disregarding the CPC's recommendation on the SUD process. Okay. May Any I, other questions uh, or comments on this? Mr. Englander? Great, thank you. Um, before I get into the technical aspects of this and look at the weight of um, the various sides um, from, well, first of all, you've got the LA Chamber on, on you know, it certainly has their opinion. BizFed has a, a different opinion. Um, so between business and labor, there's a lot of different opinions. Um, I'm just going to give mine. So with this, first of all, I think it's the time is overdue. Um, what we're talking about is we're not talking about the quality of life in local communities. We're talking about the health and welfare of people living and working in those communities. There's a big difference. We're talking about um, some of the ailments that were mentioned, such as asthma. Um, a lot of people don't think of asthma and those kinds of illnesses as being as severe as they possibly could until you know somebody that has it. Um, I sit here looking through this and I've spent months following it, reading all the material, and it comes back to me that uh, young children particularly are Im impacted and affected the most, um, as well as um, seniors. Uh, on a personal note, it's one of the reasons I'm sitting here today. Uh, I'm sitting here today because of the things that have happened in my life. Uh, my sister uh, was a severe asthmatic. We grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Some of you might remember where we used to have third stage smog alerts and we, have to have, we had to have recess. We couldn't go out, on the classroom, out, of, out of the classroom for the day. We couldn't go out on to the playground at school to play because we had a smog alert where we had to stay in the classroom, uh, where we had to stay inside at home because you couldn't go outside because you couldn't breathe the air. Um, ultimately, that took her life. And... Um, she passed away from, from that after she had a severe asthma attack and was left with permanent brain damage for 10 years. She was a school teacher for Head Start. Uh, she couldn't work again. She couldn't live on her own. Uh, it's one of the things that compelled me to run for office, to make a difference and make a change. Uh, this is very good legislation that we have to move forward and we cannot hold up. It is not holding it up... In my view, it is not holding it up to do it correctly either. Um, holding it up for three or four or five years from now is holding it up. Moving it forward with making sure that we work very closely and have not only the right staff in place and funded, which is so important to implement this critical legislation and these ordinances, Having that right person in place also means I would love to have the ombudsman's person here sitting here where we can ask questions. How are you going to roll this out? Who are you going to meet with? What are your qualifications? What's your background and experience? What's your knowledge? How are you going to embrace the local communities, the stakeholders, and the small businesses? How are you going to work with all of those different entities, including but not limited to the different utility companies, the incentive programs, looking at small business loans. Let's not forget, too, that the very people who are impacted, not just the small businesses, are the people working there. We don't, A, want them to lose their job, and B, we want to make it safer. So we have a point now where I think it's the next step forward and saying, let's do this, let's not hold it up, which means keeping it here 
isn't holding it up, if we demand back that we lay out the program and we do it correctly. I think far too often, and my colleague said it best, we apply funding and says that's going to happen down the road and then it doesn't happen. We say we're going to identify and we've put money aside and then because of the bureaucratic red tape and the process, we never get that person on board. We oftentimes do things with a carrot and a stick and then we pass the stick and don't hire the carrot. We don't bring the person on board to work with those communities or the proper staffing for enforcement. We oftentimes then don't put them in the right departments that have the institutional knowledge and to ensure that the program isn't a one-time thing. That we don't just do it for those five minutes of fame or a sound bite or something to put out to the media, but that we do it correctly. This is far too important. I want to thank all of you for coming here and for working on this tirelessly. The time to act is now. It doesn't mean to vote today, unless that's what occurs. I support doing this and moving forward with clean up, green up, but doing it correctly. Making sure we have the, the a metrics of how do you make sure that not, there are plenty of studies, and I, and I, and I will say that I, I absolutely disagree with the statement that was made earlier, that we don't have the studies out there to measure. We have plenty of studies. We have the Keck School of Medicine here testifying from USC. We have plenty of studies to show what we need to do. But what we do need in-house here in the city of Los Angeles within the correct departments is what are we going to measure? How are we going to make sure we are successful? How are we going to make sure we're held accountable and that we're moving forward in a positive manner? That we've reached out to how many businesses? How many have changed over and cleaned up? How many are we saving um, and, and ensuring they're doing the right thing. Uh, how are we measuring and working with all of our partners on this to measure those baselines and to show improvement? And, but how are we doing it internally and transparently to share that information then with the general public? Those are critical. Uh, and having the right people in place, and I'm not sure if it's just one person, I'm not sure if it's within an entire department and that becomes one of their core functions as well. I think that's the case, and it should be as well. Um, this is far too important. So I support a report coming back, and I, but I support it coming back as soon and as quickly as possible and not holding this up, but doing it correctly. I also want to thank staff. You guys have been out there, as you said, and I want to use your word, um, vetting this ad nauseum. Uh, there is a lot of input from a lot of different stakeholders, and I urge and encourage you to continue to listen to them and take all that input to say, how can we taste something good and make it great? We got one bite at the apple. We got one shot to start this off the right way, having the right people on board, hiring that right liaison, making sure that we can track and trace and hold people accountable, and that there's transparency in this process and doing it quickly. So I support moving forward but doing it correctly, and I think we're close. We're on the right track, um, and I encourage all the departments to continue tirelessly working towards um, this solution and making this a comprehensive package and piece of legislation to move forward uh, for all of those protections. So thank you very much. Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Englander. Uh, you really spoke uh, to my spirit on on that issue because I actually grew up a severe asthmatic uh, here in Los Angeles and in, in South LA. I'm old enough uh, for folks who come from that part of the city. I'm old enough um, to remember when you could not see the Hollywood sign south of Wilshire Boulevard because the smog was so bad. And folks pressed and pressed and pressed and passed what we now know and take for granted as the smog check. And people complained. I knew about the complaining because on the days I couldn't go outside and play, which were a lot, it was almost all summer some years, I'd read the newspaper and you hear the car rental companies and the chamber and this, this one and the trucking companies and, no, and everybody was like, if, we, if you make us get these smog checks, we'll all go out of business, California will go bankrupt and, and we'll all be ruined. And, and that reformed works so well that by the time I was in high school, there were no stage three days. There were no days when I couldn't go outside, and that was a very short amount of time. Of course, we all know 
The cars did not disappear at all in California. In fact, we got more of them and, and our state prospered. And, and, and I tell you that, that story because when you get caught in the details and we're discussing things like what office someone should be in, which is very, very important, and how it's going to be funded and how it's going to be regulated, uh, when you get in the weeds of something, it's easy to forget that this is the kind of thing that can change people's lives. It can make a difference between being healthy every day as a child and playing outside and doing the normal things and sitting indoors and reading newspapers all day and growing up to be a city council person. So, so I think it, it, it absolutely makes a big difference. Everybody that's working on this, I want to applaud you and thank you and ask you to stay the course uh, because, again, someone's life will be dram dramatically different because of the work that you've done. Thank you all. Um, I, I just have one question left on uh, with the other items that were discussed today, and that is the difference between an HIA and a HRA. Now, some um, issues were brought up or some questions were raised as to whether the HIA is the appropriate way to go or the HRA. Uh, it was mentioned that the HIA is rarely used. Is that uh, okay, well, for, let's go to the, to the real question is which, which, which one of those approaches will get us the best type of information we need for our purposes? I believe that HIA provides a more uh, holistic and robust analysis of health impacts. Um, you know, basically an HIA is a simple evaluation of the impacts proposed by a policy or project, and we've gone through several, uh, you know, definitions and um, metrics to identify what is really relevant for the conditional use permit being proposed. And they're all there listed, um, you know, identifying the number of people affected, the short-term or permanent impacts, the likelihood impacts will occur, how they will contribute to existing disproportionate burdens and recommended, recommended mitigation measures. I think these are important because they're going to help the decision maker who's reviewing that conditional use permit get a sense of the overall impact and not just the site-specific issues. Um, I think that they have been well used in Los Angeles. There's been several for the South LA Fast Food Health Impact Assessment, the Living Wage Ordinance Health Impact Assessment, and, and a few others. Um, different organizations can provide those services, U UCLA School of Public Health, Prevention Partners, um, Community Health Councils, Health Impact Partners, so it's not an exclusive type of um, idea. It's an emerging thing, certainly, but there's there is rigor, and I think it's an important element to the conditional use permit. So what would one study provide as versus the other? Is it one more quantitative, or what's the difference between the two? I think that's probably a fair assessment. I haven't researched HRAs as, um, as fully, but I think the H health impact assessment versus the risk is really assessing the whole issue the impact of the policy or project, whereas the risk is identifying specific, you know, risks as opposed to the overarching issue being the, the external impacts that can result from a project. When I, I thought the HRA was kind of a standard uh, measuring tool and, not, and, and that the HIA is more of an emerging emerging one. Um, so. Yeah, the HRA, the HRA um, has a bit, does have specific, um, you know, uh, sections. It is more broadly applied, but it doesn't mean that it's less effective or more effective than the HIA. Again, it's very much, I, th I relate it to something like um, CEQA has impact areas. It's very specific and finite, where the H HIA provides a more robust and holistic um, analysis of the external impacts of a project. And is it only one firm that does the HIA, or, or is it various? It's like as open as the HRA. Yeah, I think it's open. There's certainly some that specialize, but um, as I said, several different organizations here in Los Angeles provide HIA services, and um, we're not specifying um, any one particular organization. We've literally just identified key elements that need to be addressed that will help the decision maker be informed about what mitigations they should apply. Okay, and this is uh, both the HRA and the HIA more for informational purposes to the decision making body, correct? It's not a, uh, they don't have any actual jurisdiction to, uh, they, they make recommendations. I mean, they, they study it, 
it's informational. We have the information for what environmental impacts uh, one of these projects may have, correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Fuentes? Uh, you know, along that vein, I, I'm just wondering, is in the conditional use permit process, anywhere else um, in the planning world for the city of Los Angeles, do we ask for an assessment, either HIA or HRA? For a conditional use permit? So, so I, I mean, I guess effectively what we're doing is we're going to do something new yes. as it relates to the CUP. As far as I understand it, yes. Okay. And so understanding that, um, you know, to Mr. Englander's earlier point about not wasting any time, I, I also want to make sure that as we proceed forward, we're not going to be subject to any sort of legal vulnerability. So if we're going to adopt a new process uh, and we're going to be prescriptive and we're going to say that the rubric that is uh, health impact assessments versus health risk. Are, risk. Or with, risk assessment. Is there, um, so for example, it, it's analogous to this. So when you, when you do studies to understand emissions and outputs um, and that sort of thing, there are generally accepted rubrics for that type of analysis. Is either one generally uh, accepted one way or the other today? as uh, a norm or, or, for example, like the risk screen that we heard so much about, that is a generally accepted pattern and practice of how it is that uh, you can filter an area and understand what it is that the impacts are. Is, the IH, is one better than the other in terms of recognition as a rubric for assessment? Yeah, I think the risk assessment evaluates risk where the HIA evaluates impacts. I would say, true, the HRA is um, more well-known, um, but the HIA, in my opinion, is more robust, which is why it's being recommended. Sure, and, and I understand why, why someone would think it's more robust, because it's looking at more than just the site-specific impacts of a, of a, of a project. Mm -hmm. and, and so from one perspective, that would be more robust, but from a legal perspective, I'm not sure if that makes us more vulnerable on conditioning the use of a project or worse, uh, impeding findings uh, one way or the other. And so I'm just wondering, looking down the road, which one is the most possible for us to be able to not lose in court? Uh, because if we all of a sudden say that we're going to look at impacts, say, with a 10-mile radius and we should have looked at a site-specific radius, then that's going to make that particular CUP susceptible to a challenge. And so I would rather be a little bit more ambiguous and say health assessment, and I don't know if we can do that, until we figure out what's going to stand up to the rigor in court. Certainly, and I think the city attorneys will weigh in and review prior to finalization of the ordinance. I think that's definitely something to consider. Yeah, because again, you know, to, to sort of have this go the way of a, a community plan update and have to wait for a long time isn't acceptable. Okay. And so uh, I, I would um, ask, is that going to come back then at some point for us to understand which is the one that's going to stand up to the legal scrutiny? Adrian Corsani, City Attorney's Office. When we transmit part of our report can include uh, analysis as to which process is, is the preferred, um, you know, for CEQA purposes, you're always going to have to do practice. that analysis. Okay. Yeah, and so that's not going to really affect this analysis, but we can look at um, how the CUP process would differ and, and certainly which one would help us uh, be able to create a more defensible record. Okay. Um, the only question I would have is did the Planning Commission consider any other alternative methods and specifically as a policy decision choose this one? There was discussion at CPC about HRA versus HIA, and they did move forward with the HIA. Um, that's all I can s speak to on that. Um, so, and, and the reason I, I want to be so specific, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair, is that it, when it gets to the point where a decision is going to have to be made, are we going to predicate findings based on this assessment, it was, you know, one way or the other? And if we are, that's where I think we potentially are susceptible if we don't identify the one that is most naturally sort of pattern and practice in this area. If it's just going to inform the converse, conversation, you, you, you said a second ago that it's intended to be informational or somebody said, then in that case it really doesn't matter too much which way we go. But if it's going to get in the way of findings or be a part of findings, then it's going to make a significant right. difference. And so informational, I think we always have the opportunity to cast a wider screen. But if it's going to be mandated as a, as a point of an ordinance, 
I would, I would, I would want us to be very careful because I can't afford for this to slow down. Yeah, and as it's written I now, right now, it's supposed to be informative, uh, a limitation that identifies mitigations to be considered, but we'll weigh in. Okay. But if I may, there was one point sure. of clarification. Um, sure. I, I neglected to mention that the um, ombudsperson is actually a under the Environmental Affairs Officer, um, funded in part through BOS and housed in the mayor's office, if that bears any weight on the conversation previously. So um, when the Environmental Affairs Division was disbanded and many of those um, uh, individual staff members with that title, and we did a thorough research of all the titles and all the job qualifications and found the one that would fit the ombudsperson best, that was the one that fit. And Has that person been identified yet? The, uh, who would be hired? No, but the job description and all the requirements have been outlined and handed to the mayors, and I'd be happy to make that available. So is, is it a civil service position? Yes, and it is. So, is it, so when EAD was disbanded, um, a lot of that went to the Department of Sanitation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So is that where this person technically yes, and where to? Yes, and where the funding, most of the funding came from, right, and just housed within the mayor's office, if that bears any weight on the previous conversation. And, and, and you know, I think that's important because um, mayors, I'm not going to say this one in particular, have a history of stealing staff like a building in safety and then put them inside their shop. And they literally are on, everybody giggles, but they're on loan and not really part of the department anymore until they're put back. So I, I think there is a difference there still. Okay. And is the ombuds per but pers uh, a position in the ordinance before us, or is that um, just in the budget? Is that just a budget item that we supported? Right now, that's currently funded in the budget. Um, but it's, it's not in the ordinance. It's not in the ordinance because this is just modifications to Chapter 1 of the Municipal Code, which are land use and zoning policies. So if it's not in the ordinance before us, we really don't have any say over that right now. Right now, before you know, it's not part of the supplemental use district. It is in the whereas statements, but it's not in the actual code sections. Because all, because all that passed through the budget. So I was just thinking out loud here that uh, if it, that information about the ob ombudsperson, where it's housed, who does the work, I think all that language is in the budget yeah. documents, correct? Uh, yes, and then um, since w the committee has requested a CAO CLA report on the enforcement issue, Part of that report can comment on this if you like. Okay, okay. If I can just, before we forget, on um, both of the various um, different reports that we were talking about um, and trying to figure out the two differences between the, can we get just examples back of both of those as well, if I could ask? Oh, uh, examples of? Of the. Uh, HIA uh, and HRA? The, correct, yes. If we can get examples back of both of those uh, when this comes back to committee. And I'm going to ask our CLA to help me out a bit here t right now. I, I was hoping, um, after hearing the, my colleagues and their intentions and where they are and how comfortable they are, I wanted to move forward with this today and at least knowing that there's going to be some final questions that we could clean up before council. As I'm hearing this with the ombudsperson and the issue of um, you know, budget and uh, uh, and the information we need from the HIA and HRA, which Mr. Fuentes raised, can we get all that information between now and let's say a count, if we move this forward today and get it to council, or, or, or what's your assessment? Well, well, there's three different issues here. One is um, you need to request the city attorney to prepare the ordinances. So what mm -hmm. you have before you is a draft document. So city attorney needs to do the cleanup green up ordinance and they need to do also the building and safety component uh, ordinance, that's one. Two is the report that is being requested of CAO, CLA, as far as enforcement and the ombudsman position. And three is the request by Mr. Fuentes uh, to make the APC and the appeal to the council rather than the zoning administrator and the CPC. So okay. you, could re you could send the issue to city attorney, let city attorney work on uh, those ordinances and at the same time request CAO, CLA to report back on the enforcement issue. And, and that's, that could, that's uh, okay, we could work that out later. Okay. Sure, and then, and then once all of that is completed, you can reschedule it back in committee. 
in committee. Yes. And that given the amount of work that has yet to be done, you're suggesting that we come back to committee? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. M Mr. Englander? And I strongly support that. It's, it's actually, in asking for all of those three elements, and there's a couple of other ones when we get into the details, um, of sending those to the various uh, uh, agencies and departments to come back with is moving forward. It's not holding it here, it's actually moving forward. So I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea or impression that, well, we're just going to keep in committee. No, it's, it's moving forward. Um, it's a complex piece of legislation, one that's, again, near and dear to my heart, and I support um, what it sounds like this committee is about to do is move forward at yet the next step. And uh, okay. it's a big leap, so. Uh, Council, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Your other option is also to formalize all the requests as part of a committee report and send that to the city council with the understanding that it's a request, one, to city attorney, two, to the CAO, CLA, and. Uh, yeah, but that would add an additional step. Yes. That, that's going to take uh, longer. Yes. And then, and then with council recess coming and everything else, it could be another month or six weeks. Okay, or, can we be yeah. back, let's say, uh, um, What's the Tuesday after November 17? 20, that's the... Um, Clerk. What? 24th. The what? 24th. It, can we come back on the 24th? 24th of... With the, the, the information, if we have it here in committee? Of November? Uh, November. W with the information as far as the CAO CLA report? Yes. It, do you also want the city attorney ordinances by then? Yeah. That's something the city attorney would comment on if they would be ready for that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you're okay with your... I'm okay with mine. With your, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll work with CAO and... Uh, the city attorney, can you come back with some changes? It's not drastic. You know, can we be back by the 24th? Yeah, we will. Uh, we can strive to hit the 24th target and I, I guess at a minimum be able to have with some certainty information on the CUP Yeah, we can make that. Yeah. Okay. yeah okay. But we will make it our goal to finish okay. the ordinance. Okay. So, to summarize... We need a report back from the CLA and CAO with respect to resources needed to develop a program uh, for, for the ombudsperson. And for enforcement, I believe. And for enforcement. Yes. Sir. Right. We need a, a report on those two items. Yes, what does that look like? More so for the enforcement piece, we already have a, a budget allocation, correct, on the ombudsperson. Um, we also... Uh, Mr. Both Mr. Fuentes and Mr. Buscaino uh, wanted to make sure that the report on the enforcement should include a staffing plan, budget, funding sources, um, et cetera, right? So, so we've got that piece. Yes. Uh, that's enforcement and ombudsperson. The ombudsperson, uh, we also need a report back with that as to where is the best place to locate this individual. Uh, if it should be within the mayor's office that's currently proposed in the budget documents, or Department. you've heard the conversation here in terms of having a more consistent, ongoing, year after administration after administration to build that institutional knowledge, what that may look like, if there are any recommendations on that. And uh, the issue of the appeal that was made by Mr. Fuentes to go back to the original draft of the ordinance. Yes, and that's something the city planning can uh, change in their draft document. Okay. That's something. And uh, and then if we could ask as well. Yes. I'm sorry, can I just clarify for a second? That that change though is something that you want to have considered in the in the ordinance. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. And because that was a policy discussion, that may mean that the vote at council, if that ordinance goes forward with that change, is different. If, if my understanding is correct that the original recommendation was ZA to Council, APC? To AP, no, the APC. original recommendation was APC on appeal to city council. So APC was going to be the first The point. review body. And council wants to change it to, it wants to keep it as that. Okay, then never mind. Then it's good. Yeah, we want to keep it to the original planning. Okay. Uh, APC. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and then um, finally, we, we need a report back from CLA and CAO uh, or uh, working with planning department on the actual differences between HI and HRA and what that gets us. Okay. Okay. And our final point was, um, I'm not sure where people land on this, but as I was listening to the conversation in terms of its actual effective date, it may make sense to have some, because if we pass an ordinance, it takes 30 days for it to be take effect, correct? 
Um, but in having an effective date, whenever that is, not only assures us that we're doing our work to do it properly and get it there, but it actually puts some fire under whoever is responsible to get it done by that day because it will be effective that day. So that's just a thought. We should, all, we should give that some thought before we come back and for final discussion on the 24th. Okay. Are we clear on that? So we're second by, well, that's just direction uh, yes, to so staff, we'll, we'll and we'll continue this to uh, November, 20, uh, November 24th uh, uh, to Chair? give staff enough time to come back with these. It's continued to the 24th? The yes. 24th, okay. yes. Thank you. Okay. And there's a meeting that day, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. So that's the direction from... Uh, from the committee, and uh, we'll see you on the 24th on that item. Okay. Thank you. Any other items? Uh, public comment, Councilor. Okay. All right, sir. Patricia McAllister for public comment, general public comment. It greatly disturbs me that Los Angeles has become a city of illegal aliens. They're not only voting, they're driving. Uh, um, um, this uh, is public comment. Yes, it? if I could, please hold her time. This is public comment as it pertains to anything to do with planning, land use. It has to do with planning and okay. land use. Okay, thank you. I you could connect those two. Thank you. May I have my time, please? Yes. I know that planning has the plan for the next 50 years for this city. I know what the planning department does. I'm from Chicago, so we know what's going on. I know what the plan, you, you know what the plan is. My, my question to you is, what's your plan for Skid Row? What's your plan for Lamert Park? What's your plan for over here on Avarado and, and, and uh, Wilshire, where these illegals are? They're not supposed to be out there. It's against the law to have vendors out there, and you let them out there. What's your plan for that street? It's filthy, dirty. Now, genocide. Genocide is the deliberate and systematic extermination of a national racial, political, or cultural group. We need to file that with the UN. You have, you let these illegal women come here, sneak across the border from Mexico, South, Central America. They come here, have a baby, and they're living in this affordable housing when 30%, 30,000 peop uh, 30, people are homeless in Los Angeles and 90% of them are black. We have illegal aliens with children in the affordable housing. We need to get them out of those housing developments and put blacks and whites, we got whites on the street too, in those housings, Americans, and get those illegal aliens out and hope President Trump will do that. <laughs> Any other items today? No, Councilman. Thank you. 